All right, good afternoon, everybody. Um, two things. So, so Saul Silverstein's lecture that didn't get recorded. Did he send you a text summary of what's different from his lecture and last year's lecture that's on video? Yes? You, got, you all got that. Okay. So, Ashley, they did get it. Okay. Secondly, tomorrow, usually I get a separate room for, I'm uh, not tomorrow, Wednesday, usually I get a separate room for the exam. There aren't any available at this time, uh, 410. We can do it for some of you who can at 540 in a different room. So let me have a show of hands of who's available at 540 to take the exam on Wednesday instead of 410. So some of you could do it. So I will send out an announcement and I'll tell you the room number. Uh, so those of you that can't, you just come here at 410. We'll split up the exam and the other will be in some other room because there was nothing available at this hour, okay? Okay. Hey. Bless you. Yes, the room's are reserved, so it's since some, some people will do it, I will, I will send out what room it is uh, tonight, okay? It's a definite, yeah. Because it'll be too hot to have everyone in here sitting right next to each other. I don't want to do that to you, okay? Um, so we'll split you up. And I've already reserved 503 for the final exam down the hall, okay? I did that today so that we'll have that. We don't have to do this. That's May 7th, I think. Almost over. It went fast, right? All right, today I want to talk about virus-host interactions and particularly the kinds of interactions that lead to viral disease. All right, so uh, as I said, we're going to talk about virus-host interactions with, with an emphasis on disease. And the first thing we'll talk about is this concept of viral virulence, which we've brought up already quite a bit. This is the capacity of a virus to cause disease in a host. And we talk about virulent viruses that cause disease and avirulent viruses or attenuated viruses that cause reduced or no disease. Now we can measure this, we can measure virulence, and you can do it in many, many different ways. And that's what makes this a very tricky concept because depending on how you define it, it can be very different. So here are just some examples. You can inject an animal and say, how long does it take to die, mean time to death, or appearance of symptoms, or here's a typical one for influenza in mice, uh, measurement of fever or weight loss. Uh, you, can either measure, you can even measure pathological lesions. If you put a virus uh, in that goes to the brain or the CNS, you can make sections of the organs and look at lesions under a microscope, put a number on those. Or for HIV-1, you count the number of CD4 positive lymphocytes in the blood. And these are just a handful of the many ways you can quantify virulence. Here's two experimental results just to give you a, a sense for this. On the left is a graph of survival on the y-axis. X-axis is days post-infection. We've infected mice with a strain of polio virus, and we just see who's living at every day post-infection. So you can see type 1 uh, polio virus, all the mice are surviving after 15 days. Type 2, they're all dead by 15 days. So this is what I mean, the mean time to survival, you quantify virulence in this way. On the right is an example of how we use um, pathological lesions to quantify virulence. Here we're using what's called a neurovirulence score. Uh, these uh, mice have been injected with various flaviviruses. And then at a certain time after infection, you take out a sample of the brain or spinal cord and you section it and you, you look at it and count lesions caused by the virus. And you can give a number to that. And that's what's uh, shown here. So you can see the, vari the variation in the lesion score caused not only by different viruses. So dengue in the central nervous system, this is uh, cerebellum, or cerebrum, brainstem, and spinal cord. Very few lesions, say, compared to Japanese encephalitis virus. So from virus to virus, there's a big difference in virulence in the CNS. But also, from, for each virus, the different parts of the CNS are affected differently. You can see here differences in the number of lesions you see in, in the brain proper versus the, the brain stem for this virus. So not only virus-specific differences, but tissue-specific differences in virulence as well. So virulence can also be influenced by how much virus you give animals, by how you give it the root of infection, the kind of animal you use, the age, gender, susceptibility, just tons and tons of variables. So you can see this is a nightmare uh, to do. 
you cannot compare the virulence of different viruses for this reason. Because if you say, how does the virulence of smallpox compare to polio, they don't go in the same animal, and they're, they're not the same virus anyway, so you can't compare them. You can't say that smallpox is more virulent than polio. You can do other things. You can say, what is the lethality of the two viruses in people, but that's not virulence. Virulence is something else. So if you want to compare similar viruses, uh, different strains of polio, you have to assay them in exactly the same way. Really important point. So here's an example to show you how the root of inoculation influences virulence. Uh, these are suckling mice inoculated in two different ways with uh, some buniviruses, lacrosse and tanya. These are two different strains of buniavirus. So then we're looking at days after infection here, uh, the amount of virus per microliter of serum. Uh, so we, we do subcutaneous injection. You can see lacrosse uh, replicates quite well, whereas tanya doesn't replicate at all when you put it in subcutaneously. But if you inject intracerebrally right into the brain, you see both viruses can replicate. Again, this is virus per mig of brain versus time after infection. So the root of inoculation makes a big deal. Now the bottom is another example of that. Again, uh, another bunya virus, lacrosse from La Crosse, Wisconsin. Uh, you can see suckling mice and adult mice, either intracerebral or subcutaneous. This is the amount of virus you need to kill half of the animal. So it's another measure of virulence. Here we're measuring virus uh, titers as a measure of virulence. Here it is um, the amount of virus to kill half the animal. So you can see here, uh, lacrosse, one PFU is enough to kill half of suckling mice, either IC or sub-Q. Uh, the same for adult mice, except sub-Q is about 10 times higher. So you can see a difference uh, in the root only in adult mice. Here's another one, an attenuated virus that was developed to be a vaccine strain. You see a big difference in suckling mice, IC versus sub-Q. So sub-Q, you can't get an endpoint, doesn't kill half the mice no matter how much virus you put in. So that's why this is a good vaccine strain. Of course, if you put this vaccine strain right in the brain, it will kill you. It's the same virulence uh, as the wild type virus. And also you see differences in adult mice. Uh, this is in general much less virulent because you can see you need more virus uh, by either route to kill half of the animals. Just examples of how root uh, in influences virulence. So why do, why do we study virulence? We do this a lot in the laboratory. The goal is to identify genes of both the virus and the host that control it. Because if we can do that, we might be able to design, to design interventions to prevent viruses from causing disease. And the way we study this, the way we identify genes, is we make mutations. We make mutations in the virus gene or in the cellular gene. And then we see, do, can we make viruses that have either reduced or no virulence? So I'll show you an example of that on this slide. Here is a virus, hypothetical wild type virus. We're trying to identify uh, viral genes that influence its neurovirulence in mice when we inject the virus intracerebrally. So it's a very specific goal. So in the wild type virus, which forms very large plaques in cell culture, it grows very nicely. When you inject this intracerebrally into the mice, uh, it's neurovirulent. The virus replicates and it causes uh, damage of the CNS of some kind. Now we make a mutation uh, in this virus and we have two different kinds of mutations shown here. The first one is a mutation that just makes the virus replicate more poorly overall. So it forms fewer plaques on cell monolayers. When you put this virus uh, into the brain of mice, it replicates very poorly and it doesn't cause disease or it causes less disease by whatever measure. And so we say it's attenuated, but it's not a very interesting gene because all this gene does is make the virus grow more slowly. That doesn't tell us anything unique. That could be either in cell culture or in the mouse. So it's not a specific virulence gene. Now the other mutant is in a gene specifically required for virulence because this virus grows well in cell culture. The plaques are slightly smaller, but the number of plaques is the same, but in mice, this is an attenuated virus. So these are the kinds of genes we are interested in, genes that you need specifically for causing disease in animals, not just genes that you need to replicate in general. So when you do those kinds of experiments for years and years over all the different viruses that people study, 
you identify four classes of genes that regulate viral virulence right here. So first, the genes that mo modulate viral replication, which as I've said are not very interesting because they don't identify anything unique to the animal. Next, genes that modify host defense mechanisms. You've already heard us talk a little bit about these. These are uh, genes that antagonize various aspects of immune defenses. And these are typically required just for multiplication in the animal. If you take these genes out, as you'll see, they have very little effect on growth in cell culture where there's no immune response, at least not an adaptive immune response. And you have genes that allow spread of the virus in the host. Again, these are specific for the animal. These are very interesting. And finally, there are very few examples, but they do exist of uh, genes, viral genes, again, with intrinsic cell killing effects. They can cause cell death, and they do this specifically in the animal. So let's look at uh, a couple of these. First of all, not all of these mutations that reduce virulence have to be in sequences that code for proteins. They can be in what we call non-coding regions. And we have already talked about a variety of non-coding regions in viral genomes so far. You may remember the uh, picornavirus genome has this long five prime non-coding region which is involved in translation. It turns out you can make mutations there and reduce the virulence of polio. In fact, uh, the polio vaccine strains that are now used in much of the world to, to try and eradicate polio, these have mutations in the five prime non-coding region that reduce virulence. Those were selected empirically many years ago before we had molecular biology. In the same way, a related picornavirus, uh, this is called mangovirus, this is a picornavirus that infects mice, changes in, the, in a sequence called the poly C tract in the five prime non-coding region will also influence the virulence of that virus in mice. So this five prime non-coding region mutation is very interesting. Here is the five prime non-coding region of poliovirus RNA. The first base is here. Remember there's a VPG linked to it, a little protein. There's a highly structured region which we call an iris internal ribosome uh, entry site. I hope you do remember that. Okay. And then we have the AUG codon right here and where translation begins. So remember ribosomes bind internally to this sequence and proceed to the AUG. The three vaccine strains of polio, there are three that we use in the attenuated vaccine that you take orally. These were developed by Albert Sabin. They're called the Sabin vaccine strains. They all have a mutation, a single base change in uh, this loop right here. Uh, it's part of uh, stem loop six. Uh, five, sorry, right here, and there are three of them right here. So the type 1 strain has, has a base change here, the type 2 and the type 3. Each of them has one base change, and this one base change, although it's not the only mutation present in these vaccines, these are enough to markedly reduce the virulence of this virus in humans and in animal models. So I want to show you an example of how that works. We've studied this mutation in my lab many years ago. And this is an experiment where we infect mice with two different polioviruses with either a C or a U at base 472. So base 472 is right here in this stem loop 5. And the U is the change in the vaccine type 3 strain. The wild type parent is a C. So in people, people who get polio with type 3, their viruses have C at this position. The vaccine strain has a U. And just having that U there uh, prevents the vaccine from causing paralysis in recipients. So here are mice infected with either strains with a C or a U at 472. They only differ at that one position. We put the virus right in the brain and then we wait at different times looking for virus replication in the bottom curve. So this is virus per gram of brain. You can see viruses with C they grow really well whereas the viruses with U are cleared. And if you measure the LD50 or the PD50, lethal dose or paralytic dose, the amount of virus you need to do kill or paralyze 50% of the animals, viruses with a C9000 PFU are enough to kill or paralyze half of the mice. The virus with a C, you, you can put as much virus as you want in and you don't get any mice paralyzed. So one base does this in a non-coding region. And we think that this somehow influences this process of internal ribosome entry. All right, so those, that's an example of a gene that uh, modifies replication, but in a very specific way inside of a host. Uh, 
Now, how about genes that modify immune defenses? Again, you've heard Dr. Silverstein talk about these. We have viral kinds, which are mimics of cytokines. So as you know, re immune responses produce cytokines to do a variety of jobs. Uh, and these are mimics that inhibit their activity by binding to the receptors. There are also mimics of the cytokine receptors, this, which are soluble. And these bind up the actual cytokines and block their function as well. So these are not needed for replication in cells. You can take them out of the virus, and the virus grows quite nicely in cells. Most of them are enlarged DNA viruses, pox viruses, and herpes viruses. Um, and as I said, they are viral kinds or viral receptors. There are also proteins that affect antigen presentation. You heard that from Dr. Silverstein as well. There are proteins that interfere with autophagy and apoptosis. All of these typically in the, in the larger DNA virus. So, so these are what I mean by uh, genes that modify host defense mechanisms. So here's an example from a herpes virus, gamma herpes virus 68. It's a gene called M3. I right, just want to show you this as an example, not, not that you would need to ever know that M3 does this. Uh, on the left is a percent survival, a survival curve of uh, mice infected with three different viruses, the wild type virus in blue and a mutant virus in which the M3 gene has been deleted. So M3 encodes a chemokine receptor which is needed to antagonize immune responses. So the wild type virus you see kills vice, mice very efficiently. If you want to do a comparison, let's take 50% survival. So that's about 5 PFU of virus for the wild type. Now if you delete the gene, uh, now the 50% kill is a, over 100 PFU. So you can see this has attenuated the virulence of this virus as measured just by lethality. If we then, now when you do these experiments, when you delete a gene, you always want to make sure that you haven't made any other changes by accident in the genome because this can happen during modification. So what you do is you put the gene back in and you make sure you now have a wild type phenotype. And that's what this is. It's called marker rescue and that's as good as wild type at killing mice. So you know the virus doesn't have any other mutations in its genome. On the right is an example of the kinds of cells that are present uh, in the CNS of the animals injected with this virus. So we have, again, the wild type and the deletion mutant. Uh, and we're looking, we, we infect mice and we take a section, say of brain, and then look at the different cell types, macrophages, neutrophils, lymphocytes, monocytes. And this is to tell us um, if the absence of the chemokine receptor has an effect on the distribution of cells. And in fact, it does. So if you look at wild type, uh, virus, you see there's a certain percentage of macrophages, neutrophils, less lymphocytes and fewer monocytes present. And when you take away uh, the chemokine receptor gene, you see you change the proportion of cells. You get more macrophages, you get less neutrophils. So this is, a, this is an expected phenotype because it's a chemokine receptor. Uh, okay, now the next class are toxic proteins that cause direct damage to cells. In general, in viruses, there are not too many of these kinds of gene products. In bacteria, there are lots of toxins that make you sick in various ways. Diphtheria toxin, for example, one of the most famous ones. But there are a few in viruses. One of them is encoded in the genome of rotaviruses. These are uh, double-stranded RNA viruses, major agents of gastroenteritis. We'll talk about those more later. Uh, these make a protein called NSP4. And if you take NSP4 and sy you synthesize it and you feed it to laboratory animals, it will make them have gastroenteritis. Okay, so that protein alone mimics most of the pathogenic effects of virus infection. And this is just illustrating what this NSP4 does. These are the little red triangles here. This is the epithelial layer of your uh, intestinal tract. This virus is ingested, it goes to your intestine, and it replicates in these cells. And in so doing, it produces this toxin, uh, NSP4, both intracellularly and it's also present extracellularly. And it does, it, we think that this toxin is involved in the fluid imbalance, which is part of gastroenteritis. You get diarrhea, that's because you're not absorbing all the fluid that's present in your intestine, and we think this uh, toxin is responsible. For that. One of the ways it seems to do it, uh, it seems to bind a receptor on cells which stimulates a uh, phospholipase C pathway 
where, where IP3, inositol triphosphate, is generated, and this ends up raising intracellular calcium levels. And the intracellular calcium has a couple of effects. It messes up the tight junctions, which loosens up the epithelium, and that helps water to get out. A and it also results in the cells excreting chloride. And when that happens, then more fluid stays in the intestine to try and counteract the high concentration of chloride, and that's why you get diarrhea. So there's uh, a few other examples like this of toxins, but these are virulence determinants. You could take this out of the virus, and it wouldn't affect its ability to grow in cell culture, but it would reduce its virulence in an animal. Another example of, uh, a, of a determinant, this is a cellular virulence determinant now, is a protein called Trim5-alpha. And this is a, pr a protein that is involved in susceptibility to uh, HIV. So HIV, which, as you know, is, infects millions and millions of people, uh, does not infect old world monkeys. All right? uh, the virus can get into these cells. There are receptors on the lymphocytes of these animals. The virus gets in. But there is a block before reverse transcription. Remember, reverse transcription occurs in the cytoplasm as the particle is coming in, uh, there's a block before that stage. And the way this, it, it, and that block is mediated by this protein called Trim5-alpha. What it does is it basically degrades the viral capsid, so reverse transcription doesn't occur. Trim5 binds the capsid. Here's the viral capsid of HIV. It's a very unusual shape. It's not, um, doesn't have the typical icosahedral shape. Uh, it is bound by uh, Trim5-alpha here and it dissociates it. So that blocks reverse transcription. So this is actually an evolutionarily developed resistance mechanism that old world monkeys have to the virus. We don't have this. Our trim 5 doesn't block infection, obviously, otherwise it wouldn't be present. But studying this sort of restriction is useful because it gives us ideas about how to uh, interfere with human infection. What's an old world monkey? What's an old world monkey? Compared to a new world monkey? Well, the old world. Africa versus That's South America. Uh, it came into humans from monkeys, but it's probably been around for a much longer time because if you go back and sequence these trim-5 alleles in, in uh, old world monkeys, you can see the effect of viral pressure millions of years ago. So the virus has been around for a long time. It just jumped into us in the 20s, basically. Uh, another example of a cellular determinant of virulence, MIR-122, a microRNA. I think we talked about this before. This is a liver-specific microRNA. It's involved in cholesterol metabolism, so it has a function in us. It just so happens that hep C needs this in order to replicate in the liver. And uh, now in trial are drugs that specifically block MIR-122. Uh, and this has already been in chimpanzees, and it, it lowers virus loads and, and significantly reduces disease uh, in those animals. So, so it's basically we're targeting a cellular microRNA to prevent uh, virus replication. So this is probably going to end up in people if all the safety and efficacy trials work out. Okay, so those are, those are some of the genes that are involved in uh, virulence of viruses. Let's move on to another consideration, is, and that is how do viruses cause disease in us? What are the mechanisms? And one of them is, of course, the fact that viruses can kill cells. We, we have talked about cytopathic effects uh, from day two here in this course, you know that in some viruses you infect cells, the cells come off the monolayer, they break open. That's a cytopathic effect. So in animals, viruses can do that as well. So if a virus can lyse motor neurons in an animal, it's, it's likely that that is the mechanism by which it causes paralysis. Viruses also inhibit host synthetic processes like uh, RNA synthesis and protein synthesis, and that contributes to cell killing as well. Uh, when you inhibit cellular syntheses, you, you basically uh, ruin cellular compartmentation. Enzymes leak out of, say, lysosomes. They end up auto-digesting the cell, and that contributes to cell death. As you also heard earlier, uh, viruses can induce cell-cell fusion, the formation of giant cells with many nuclei called syncytia. That's another way that cells cause, uh, viruses cause cell damage. And then finally, apoptosis. The induction of apoptosis is also responsible for cell for damage in the infected animal. But it turns out that in most infections, most of the damage that we see, 
the, the tissue damage, the symptoms that you have, most of it is immunopathological. That is, it's a consequence of the immune response. So, you know, we, immune response we need, otherwise we wouldn't be surviving, but it also hurts us. That's why we call it too much of a good, de of a good thing. So you've, you've already heard me tell you how the, the general symptoms of a virus infection, fever, tissue, aches, pains, nausea, are a consequence of inflammation. And on top of that, uh, the tissue damage is also a, a host res consequence of immune response, as you'll see in a minute. So among all the viruses we talk about, if you had to group them into two classes, you could say there are cytolytic viruses, the viruses that kill cells, and there are non-cytolytic viruses. And the, the cytolytic viruses, you can imagine that a great amount of their tissue pathology is caused by cytolysis. But there are many viruses that don't damage cells. And in fact, in you, when you get tissue damage from these non-cytolytic viruses, it's ma mainly a consequence uh, of your immune response. So this is immunopathology, uh, and we'll explore this for, for a good uh, time today. So these are examples of immunopathology, that is, uh, different sorts of infections, the pathology caused by a variety of immune responses. So you can have CD8, T cell mediated immune response, because these are the CTLs that are meant to lyse infected cells as a way of clearing an infection, but they cause tissue damage. We can also have immunopathology uh, caused by the two kinds of CD4 T cells, the Th1 or the Th2. And finally, you can even have antibody into this mix. Antibodies can cause tissue pathology. So I want to go through a couple of these to give you an example of uh, how this works. So here first we'll look at CTLs, CDA positive T cells or cytotoxic T cells. Uh, this is infection of mice with a virus called lymphocytic choreomeningitis virus. This is a, mainly an animal of rodents, but if you happen to be immunosuppressed for whatever reason and you have a hamster, you could be infected with this virus. There have been examples of people who have died of viral infections and then turned out they were on some sort of immunosuppressive therapy and they had a hamster and the virus went from the hamster into them. But in healthy people, it doesn't cause any problems. If you take this virus, LCMV, and put it intracerebrally into adult mice, within eight days they're dead of a brain infection called choriomeningitis. <clears throat> if you do the same experiment and then immunosuppress the mice, you give them some drug to suppress immune responses, broadly immunosuppressive, those mice are fine. They get a persistent infection where the virus is continually replicating in them and they can live forever, essentially. So just by suppressing uh, the response, you've protected them from death. Now, if you now give them CD8 cells, CTLs, which you have now taken from a mouse immunized with the virus. So they are virus-specific CD8 cells, C CTLs. Okay, it's very important. If you inject these mice with those cells, it's called adoptive immunization when you give them cells, immune cells, then they will now die within five days. Yes? That is why animal models are animal models, because they're really different from people. We don't, I don't have a specific answer for you, but this happens over and over again, that observations made in animals are not predictive of what happens in people, and that's one of them. That's just one of them. <clears throat> so this shows that CD8 CTLs are responsible for the disease. Uh, here's another example of CTL-mediated disease. This is Coxsackie virus. This is a Picorna related to polio from Coxsackie, New York. Uh, in humans, um, infection with Coxsackie ends up, in many cases, having you get a heart transplant because it targets your heart, destroys the muscle, and by the time you get symptoms, it is too late to treat the infections. And there's a mouse model for this where you can look at heart destruction caused by virus replication. So on the left here is a section from the heart of a mouse that had been infected with Coxsackie virus, and it is stained with a dye that stains uh, the, the calcification that occurs in the myocardium when this virus destroys the tissue. So you can see there's extensive uh, myocardial destruction here. 
if you do the same infection of a mouse that lacks the gene encoding perforin, that's what you see on the right here. This is, a, this is no pathology in the heart of this mouth. Perforin, of course, is one of the two proteins in a CTL that is responsible for its ability to kill target cells. So if you take away the ability of CTLs to kill targets, you now remove the pathology uh, caused by this virus. So it's very interesting, the pathology, the heart pathology entirely caused by the immune response. In mice, the virus also infects uh, a couple of other tissues. Here is the virus will get into the CNS and kill mice. And again, uh, the mice who die, this is survival versus time. The wild type mice die, the perforin knockout mice don't die. So again, the destruction of brain cells is caused by CTLs. And liver, the virus also infects the liver. Uh, this is the release of a liver enzyme into the blood, uh, GLDH. So many virus infections that cause liver damage end up releasing enzymes from the liver cells that are not normally found in the blood. So you can measure uh, the extent of disease by measuring a liver enzyme. So you can see wild type mice, the enzyme, the virus replicates in the liver, the enzyme is released into the blood. The perforin knockout mice, there's no release, there's no liver damage. So three targets of this virus in mice, the pathology all caused by CD8 uh, CTLs. So someday maybe if we could diagnose this infection in people very early, we could treat the infection, either give an antiviral or if the infection has progressed, maybe interfere with CDO, CD8 killing. Uh, another virus that uses um, CTLs to cause damage, hepatitis B virus. And this is a mouse model, but presumably similar things happen in people. Uh, the envelope protein, um, if you make just the envelope glycoprotein of the virus, remember this is an envelope virus, it's a single envelope glycoprotein. If you make transgenic mice uh, that produce that envelope, they're okay. They don't get any disease and there's no virus in them. If you now inject virus-specific CTLs into those transgenic mice, they get liver disease, right? They, div they get liver lesions. And this is because the uh, CTLs induce apoptosis in, in the hepatocytes of the mice. And so that's diagrammed here. You take a, uh, a non-transgenic mice, you immunize them and purify CT8, CTLs, CD8-positive CTLs from them, and then you inject them into the transgenic mice, and this mouse develops liver disease. So again, the, the assumption is that the CTLs are causing the tissue damage. CD4 T cells can also cause immunopathology. Um, these, compared with CD8s, these make more cytokines. Remember the CD4s uh, secrete cytokines that either promote antibody production or CTL production, so they make a lot of cytokines. And so these uh, CD4 cells can recruit lots of different kinds of immune cells in infected area, and these cytokines can cause tissue damage and the cells that are recruited can cause tissue damage as well. So these, these CD4s can tend to be participating in quite a few um, immunopathologies. Here's one example of a CD4 T cell associated immunopathology. This is herpes stromal keratitis. It is blindness basically caused by a her herpes virus infection of the eye. It's one of the most common causes of blindness in developed countries. Because as you know, herpes infections are ubiquitous. Everyone has them, and a, and a proportion of those uh, go on to cause blindness. And this is entirely immunopathological. It involves CD4-positive Th1 cells. Uh, what happens here, you get repeated infections, and as you do, each infection causes opacity of the cornea, and eventually you can't see. So you can see uh, this is an example of that right here. Now, how does this work? So here's a section of cornea. And on the outside is the corneal epithelium on the left. Below it is the stroma. Now the virus only infects uh, these epithelial cells. And when that infection occurs, of course there's an immune response and CD4 cells are recruited. Uh, these produce cytokines. So in this right panel, uh, you can see the stromal layer has now lots of dark staining cells compared to the one on the left which is uninfected. These are CD4 positive T cells and they're secreting cytokines and that's causing tissue damage. And eventually this cornea is damaged by the production of cytokines, the recruitment of various inflammatory cells. Uh, 
and with multiple infections you get blindness. So again, that's entirely immunopathological. The virus does not replicate in the stroma of the eye. It only replicates in the epithelium, but that's enough to recruit the CD4 cells uh, to the stroma. Many viruses um, make rashes on your bodies, and most of these are in fact immune reactions of various sorts. I think we talked a little bit about rashes before. Measles, smallpox, varicella, zoster, many others produce these rashes. So basically what happens is you have an infection of skin cells. This is typically, depending on the virus, it can be spread from the outside, the papilloma viruses, or um, the measles and smallpox viruses are spread by viremia. The virus replicates in skin cells, and that causes an immune response. And the cells that migrate to the infected foci release cytokines. Uh, that causes um, inflammation, recruits T cells, and in many cases the CTLs start to lyse the infected cells, and that gives you the rash. And so the rash is a combination of inflammation and cell killing uh, by the immune response. If the virus were just replicating, you most likely would not see much of a rash in these diseases. Um, here's an example where an innate immune response is responsible for more serious disease. This is a mouse model for West Nile encephalitis. The so West Nile, of course, is a flavivirus spread by mosquitoes. Mostly a benign infection, but at a low rate, it can get into your brain, and when it multiplies there, it causes an encephalitis. Uh, it turns out that, at least in mice, TLR3, toll-like receptor 3, is a sensor for West Nile virus, and when it senses infection, it produce, the result is the production of cytokines, including TNF alpha, that loosens up the blood-brain barrier, and that actually lets the virus into the brain. So you get a peripheral infection with West Nile, your infected cells produce TNF, and the TNF goes to your brain, loosens up the blood-brain barrier, and lets the virus in. Trojan horse sort of thing. So here's an uh, experiment that shows that. So these are mouse brains uh, taken at different times from infected mice. So what you do is you infect the mice and then you give them also a dye that normally doesn't get into this, to the brain unless the permeability is altered by TNF. And you can see wild type by day three, the brain is blue. That's the dye getting into the brain. If you do a TLR3 knockout, you see there's no dye or very little at day three and it's delayed very much. So TLR3, again, is responsible for sensing infection. It produces cytokines that loosen up the blood-brain barrier. And TLR3 is a sensor for double-stranded RNA. So if you give these mice uh, double-stranded RNA, here's a wild-type mouse given double-stranded RNA. You can see the brain is completely permeabilized by that. It's full of dye. If you give a TLR3 knockout double-stranded RNA, there's no uh, infiltration of the dye into the brain. So the innate response can also cause uh, immunopathology. We don't know if this is true in people of course, uh, but you could learn if you had people with encephalitis caused by uh, West Nile, you could sequence their genome and look, you could sequence the TLR3 gene and see if there's some mutations that uh, cause null phenotypes, for example. Uh, an example of a immunopathology caused by antibodies is dengue fever. Dengue is a disease caused by dengue virus, a flavivirus. We've talked about dengue before. Uh, these are plus-strand plus RNA viruses. It's called breakbone fever because your bones feel really painful. It feels like they're breaking. Uh, it's transmitted by Aedes aegypti, and it is endemic in many parts of the world, particularly where the mosquito is present, of course. B billions of people are at risk. That is, they could acquire dengue infection globally. And it's, there are about currently 50 to 100 million infections documented every year in these areas, second to malaria in, in terms of incidence of uh, mosquito-borne diseases. So here is the current uh, location of the vector in yellow, and <clears throat> in red are the areas with the vector as well as dengue activity. So you can see uh, Central and South America, not all of it, but parts of it, the Caribbean in particular. I have a friend who just came back from Puerto Rico and he, and he developed dengue within three days of coming back to the city. 
So you can do that. You can import it. It's not in the US, just imported. Parts of Africa, uh, Asia, Southeast Asia, and even a little bit of Australia as well. This, um, the mosquito used to be very restricted. See, in 1981, it wasn't present in Central and South America, 80s Egypti. But it has spread there currently, and it spreads in tires, used tires. There's a huge used tire trade. You know, you wear your tires out, and you buy a new one, and the guy at the station takes them for a buck, and he sells them. They go on container ships, and they go all over the world to get recycled. They always have water in them. You can't get rid of it. If you spent time to dump the water out, it wouldn't be worthwhile. So the water breeds mosquitoes, and that's how they spread uh, all over the world. If you remember the Asian tiger mosquito that we talked about in terms of chikungunya, also has been spreading by the tire trade. Anyway, getting back to dengue, a primary dengue infection gives you typical symptoms of, of a viral infection with the addition of this very painful um, aches in the, in the bones. But otherwise, you can see uh, pretty nonspecific symptoms. It's less self-limiting. So my friend, he recovered in a week. He was fine. He, he couldn't walk very well because his bones were hurting him. But um, he recovered. I saw him yesterday, and I said, don't go back to the Caribbean again. Don't go anywhere where dengue is endemic, because you could die. And here's why. So in primary infections, <laughs> 1 in 14, yeah, he was really sad. But he likes Chile and Argentina, which is free of dengue. So. In 1 in 14,000 primary infections, so these are these non-serious non, non ones, you can get what's called dengue hemorrhagic fever. You start to bleed, your capillaries are, are ruptured, you bleed, you lose fluid, you, sh you get shock, and you can die from that if you're not uh, given proper therapy. So that requires you to be hospitalized and given intravenous fluids and so forth. Um, so that's a primary infection. So most people don't get that. When you are infected and recover, you make antibodies to the virus. There are four serotypes of dengue. The problem is, if you get infected with a different serotype, you will have a memory response to the first serotype that infected you, and that will bind, those antibodies will bind virus, but it will not block infectivity, and it will make the disease worse. I'll tell you how it does that. So you get a, did you have a question? Yeah. yeah. Yes. So viruses that are mosquito transmitted would be the mosquito or blood, you know, contaminated needles could do it. Okay, so how, I mean, sexual activity can't transmit this in any case where it's just never happened? You know, I, I have not seen it. I mean, theoretically it could, but it's, I think it's quite rare. Yeah. That's right. I think that for those seven to ten days, you're not likely uh -huh. to have sexual activity, yeah. <laughs> so, um, it could be, but there's an asymptomatic phase when you have virus. Maybe it's not enough. So that's a good question because there might not be enough virus in your blood to transmit it that way, but a mosquito may take a blood meal. So it is mainly transmitted from person to person via the mosquito. So you have to have quite a viremia for the mosquito to pick it up. It may not, it may not be compatible. I have never heard it being sp spread that way. So you make antibodies, a memory response to the first serotype. These will bind serotype 2, 3, or 4, whatever you get the second time. And they don't neutralize it. But then having an antibody bound to a, a virion allows it to get taken up into macrophages. Macrophages have FC receptors, which bind this FC portion of the antibody. So normally dengue doesn't infect the macrophage. But now it can get in. It can multiply. The macrophage will be recognized by uh, CTLs and lysed or the virus can lyse the macrophages, and this is bad. When you lyse a macrophage, uh, it's, it's uh, releasing all the cytokines that are present in that, and they shouldn't be normally released. So these include you know, interferons, TNF-alpha, and those, end, those cytokines end up permeabilizing your capillaries. That's why you bleed, you have plasma leakage, and you can have shock. So it's, a, it's interesting. It's an antibody-based immunopathology. And now, after a second dengue infection, the incidence of this shock syndrome, which can kill you, goes up to 1 in 90. So it's much more frequent. So that's why a lot of people are at risk for now for deng serious dengue disease in these countries where the virus and the vector are present. And a lot of effort is being put into making a vaccine to protect everyone against all four serotypes. Because as I said, billions of people are at risk for infection. Cause it, so this can just get more serious. Is the primary infection also an overreaction? 
Well, the, some of the, com some of the um, symptoms, of course, are your typical cytokine-based fever, headache, backache, you know, TNF distributing globally, yes. Um, but the fatal ones are for sure, yes. So basically any uh, vaccine would need to protect against all four serotypes at the same yeah. time, otherwise it would just... Yes, absolutely. You've got to have a four-component vaccine and they all have to work equally well. That's right. Otherwise, you have the same situation. Yeah. Uh, another example of antibody-based immunopathology. In many infections, you can have long-term virus multiplication. You make an antibody response. The antibodies bind the virus, but they don't clear it. And these antibody um, virus complexes can start to come, um, reach very high concentrations, and then they will clog your tiniest capillaries and this typically happens in the brain and the kidney where the capillaries are tiny and easily clogged by these immune complexes and that can give you uh, various symptoms so in the, in the in various capillaries in general it's called vasculitis it's an inflammation of the capillary bed because of the de deposition glomerulonephritis a very specific kidney disease caused by uh, deposition of immune complexes and when they deposit in your brain, you get confused. So uh, that's because the capillaries are blocked up. So here's an example of what goes on in the kidney. As you know, the kidney filters out uh, toxins from the blood, and that is done uh, in the glomeruli. So normally you have a capillary bringing blood through, and material comes out of the capillary uh, into the surrounding space. If you have antibody antigen complexes depositing in here, uh, you can see there are a lot more in this condition here. This, this brown cell called the mesangial cell, its function is to remove any particles that are coming out of the blood. And if it sees a lot of immune particles, it extends itself. The cells get very big. It blocks off the capillary and the filtration decreases. So that's glomerulonephritis. It's basically an immune complex disease. We talked about radical injury of cells before. Uh, these are superoxide and nitric oxide radicals produced by the innate response. Uh, we'll just review it again. Uh, nitric oxide synthase is an interferon stimulated gene uh, and it converts an amino acid to nitric oxide which can then modify proteins on their self hydro groups or be converted to a more reactive radical peroxynitrite. The idea is in infected areas uh, this enzyme is produced and it it carries out a non-selective assault on the infected and uninfected cells with the idea of trying to limit infection, kill all the cells in an infected area. So it's typically brought in by uh, phagocytic migratory cells to an infected area and you get damage to the, to the cells. So this is another form of cell injury by the immune response. You can show that, for example, in mice, if you knock out the gene for nitric oxide, they have less damage uh, with, when infected with certain viruses. Another uh, outcome of virus infection can be autoimmunity. Now, an autoimmune disease, of course, when you make an immune response against yourself. And virus infections seem to trigger these very reproducibly in animals. There's some evidence that it happens also in people, but it's, it's, it's a bit controversial. And one of the mechanisms is, so in us, we have many antigens that are hidden from the immune system and therefore we don't the immune system doesn't detect them but virus infections can change that they can cause tissue damage that exposes otherwise hidden epitopes and then you make an immune response against them they're not recognized as self they're recognized as foreign uh, and then during this infection you have the antibodies or the cellular response directed against your tissue so that exacerbates the infection so that's one mechanism for this autoimmunity another is mimicry so it turns out that some epitopes in viral proteins are, are shared with our cellular proteins. So you get an infection, the, you get an immune response against the viral epitopes, and some of those cross-react with your proteins, and as a consequence, you get host damage as well. And this is uh, a, just a listing of some epitopes that are shared between virus and host proteins. You can see here there's a, s a similar sequence between polio, one of the capsid proteins in the acetylcholine receptor. So these are very short sequences, they're epitopes. And if you, immun if you immunize animals with these peptides, you can demonstrate cross-reactivity. 
So we make an antibody against this sequence, it will react with the acetylcholine receptor. And the same with all these other uh, virus epitopes as well. So the, in theory, this could contribute to um, uh, an autoimmune reaction. Yes? Yeah, so you would, if it were identical, it would be recognized as self. But you can see there's, there's slight differences that probably prevent that from happening. That would be my guess. And then you get, a, you get enough of a reaction. It's non-self that you get this occurring. That's, that would be my guess. I don't know. Whether, again, whether this is working in human infections, we don't know. But it's been de demonstrated extensively in animal models. Many virus infections also immunosuppress. And they do it globally. Um, they replicate in cells of the immune system. They uh, disturb signaling that's important for cytokine production. And you remember the viroceptors or virokines, these are antagonizing immune responses. These are a form of immunosuppression. Um, here's an example, an experimental example. Now, if you, um, I don't know if any of you have ever had this done, but if, if you want to know if you've ever had tuberculosis, you get a, a TB tine test. Anybody ever have that? You've had it. You're an old guy like me, right? But basically, you put a little tuberculin antigen intradermally into your forearm. And if you've had tuberculosis, uh, within a few days, you get a cellular immune response to the antigen, and you get a bump. You get inflammation and T cells coming in to... Uh, to check out the antigen and it makes a physical bump. So it's called a delayed type hypersensitivity reaction. So measles infection suppresses that. All right, so here's an experiment where they took uh, people who um, were incubating with measles and they gave them a time test at different times, either before infection or before symptoms and then at different times uh, after the rash. So here is the, in duration is simply the height of the bump on the arm. They measure it in millimeters. So you get, this is an eight millimeter in duration before the rash. And this individual, at the time of the rash, if you then put a, t um, a TB test somewhere else, you don't get any response at all because the virus is suppressing the lymphocyte in induction. And you see that ev eventually goes away. So the immunosuppression subsides different weeks after uh, the rash. So this is an example of measles virus immunosuppression of a T cell response as measured by uh, the, the tuberculin tine test. So these are three examples of viruses that cause substantial immunosuppression. Measles we just talked about. Um, the virus infects monocytes and thymic epithelial cells and as I showed you uh, it causes a reduced delayed type hypersensitivity you also are more susceptible to other infections from the time that you have uh, measles. Rubella also causes immunosuppression, infects lymphoid cells, and HIV, perhaps the most famous, it, inf it infects and destroys CD4 positive T cells. And this gives you uh, opportunistic infections which uninfected people normally don't obtain. And it also leads to neoplasia, which, as you know, is kept in check by the immune system. As soon as it's wiped out by HIV replication, you get lots of different cancers. Now, measles virus immunosuppression, uh, the virus also infects dendritic cells and monocytes. So remember, the, the DCs are important for sensing other infections. So this compromises your ability to sense an infection as foreign. Your circulating T cells are decreased by half, uh, and you get aberrant cytokine responses because of the and because of this, you get skewed Th1 and two, Th2 responses. So measles infection does all of these things, and that's why one of the reasons why you get immunosuppression. Now, for the last 10 minutes or so, I want to talk about susceptibility to disease. We've talked about the various mechanisms that viruses can cause injury, but what makes you susceptible to infection? We've talked about a couple of these genes before. I think we talked about the MX gene, which is a mouse gene that determines susceptibility to influenza virus. There's another mouse gene called FLV that determines susceptibility to flaviviruses. FLV encodes uh, this oligo A synthetase, which you may remember is an interferon-induced gene. It's important for activating RNA cell that degrades viral genomes. Uh, these are both discovered in mice. They don't appear to have any role in people, though presumably there are 
similar situations where genes are controlling susceptibility to disease. Here's an example of the FLV gene. We have two kinds of mice here, a susceptible strain uh, and a resistant strain. The resistant strain has the FLV gene. The susceptible has a deletion or a mutation in the gene. You can see uh, these mice all die, the susceptible ones. Having the FLV gene uh, makes you resistant. You do have about 50% mortality, but you can see there's a clear difference in virus replication. So these kinds of experiments are done to identify these susceptibility genes in animals. In people, it's harder because you can't, uh, you can't make strains of people. You just have to work with what's there. So this is, it's very rare to f identify uh, genes that influence infection, but with the ability to sequence genomes very quickly and cheaply, this is becoming more uh, typical now. And typically what we find are genes that um, modulate intrinsic and innate immune systems. So for example, uh, if you remember from way back at the beginning of this course, a co-receptor for HIV is, CC, is a chemokine receptor, C CR5. So HIV needs to attach to both CD4 and the chemokine receptor in order to infect cells. So this is a chemokine receptor. Uh, it's involved in immune responses. Um, there are a number of individuals, I think about 5% of the world's population, has a naturally occurring mutation in the gene encoding this, and they are resistant to infection. Interestingly, they're more susceptible to West Nile infection, which suggests perhaps that this chemokine receptor is important for resolving that infection. But that's an example of a polymorphism that was identified in people because there are so many people uh, with the trait. Uh, there have been a number of very interesting studies with herpes simplex and cephalitis. So as you remember, herpes infects just about everyone and in a very small fraction of children between a few months old and a year or two of age, the primary herpes infection, about one in 250,000 will develop uh, herpes encephalitis. So the virus gets in the brain, it multiplies there and can cause some problems. If you sequence these individuals, you find that they have mutations in components of innate immunity. So a couple of years ago, it was found that mutations in TLR3 and a second protein called UNC93B uh, predispose people to getting herpes simplex encephalitis. So TLR3, you may remember, is a sensor for double-stranded RNA. So the children have mutations in TLR3 that block its function, basically. So they can't sense the infection, and for that reason, it goes to the brain. The, the other protein, UNC93B, is thought to be an accessory required for function of TLR3. Now, we just discussed a paper on TWIV-175 where another paper came out showing mutations in TRIF are also found in some children with herpes simplex encephalitis. So for example, TRIF is one of the adapter proteins that allows signaling from TLR3 uh, to the production of inflammatory cytokines. And these children have uh, single base mutations in their TRIF genes that block its function. And these are presumably required uh, or explaining why they get encephalitis. So rare cases of viral disease like herpes simplex encephalitis can be explained by uh, autosomal mutations such as these. The major histocompatibility proteins also encode uh, susceptibility or, or resistance to virus infections. Now, uh, island populations, which are, are relatively isolated, um, tend to have a, a, a less uh, broad MHC composition than other populations, and they tend to be more susceptible uh, to virus diseases. Here's an example uh, of an infection of mice with a virus. There are two different strains of mice here, two different H2 haplotypes. And you can see one is very susceptible and one is quite resistant. So the nature of the molecules, the MHC molecules that present antigen, are a major uh, influence on disease susceptibility. Your age also influences susceptibility to infections. Typically very young and very old people tend to be the most susceptible. When you're young, months of age, up to a year, you have a poorly developed immune response, so you're not, you're not very good at resisting virus infections. But the trade-off is sometimes uh, young kids have less immunopathology, right? So in diseases that where the, the component of the disease, the major component is immunopathology, young kids fare better because they don't have these consequences. 
Yeah. Yeah. So, yes. Is it the innate immune system or the adaptive that are too immature or both? They're both um, developing at a young age. Yeah. So the one, one example that we talked about, the infection of adult mice with uh, LCM. Remember, LCM infection of adult mice, they die unless you immunosuppress them. Well, if you infect infant mice, I see, they survive because they're, they haven't developed their CTL response yet. And that's sort of like immunosuppressing an adult. So why do old people get more infected? Well, they have, their muscles are worse, they don't function as well, particularly the respiratory muscles aren't as elastic, aren't as powerful, the cough response isn't as good, the cilia, the cilia elevator isn't as good. All of these reasons probably play into it. So here are two examples of age-specific susceptibility to infection. Uh, this is West Nile virus in rats. On the top, we're looking at uh, how much virus you need to uh, kill half of the animals. And so these are uh, age-specific, so very young to very old. So you need, <clears throat> the, the very young are very susceptible. You need very little virus uh, in order to cause disease. And as you can see, with age, the amount of virus you need to cause, to kill 50% of the animal uh, goes down until when you're in the older rats, two weeks basically as an old rat, uh, you, you need uh, much less, much more virus. And it's the same, this correlates with replication in the brain. So here we're looking at replication of the virus in the rat brain, uh, one and a half days of inoculation, 16 days and three months. So you see the, the youngest rats, the virus replicates very well in the brain, less so in the intermediate age and then hardly at all in three month old rats. <clears throat> In humans, this also applies, the age susceptibility. There are a number of studies that demonstrate this. This is a, an epidemiological study of measles in the Faroe Islands, which are north of the UK. And you can see in the very young uh, mice, less than one year old, uh, the mortality, this is the annual mortality in percent, is much higher than in other age groups. But then when you start getting into the older population, the mortality goes up again. So again, the very young, and the very old are the most susceptible. So these are cases of fatal measles uh, in this island. There are some exceptions to these which are very interesting. Uh, polio, mumps, measles tend to be milder at a young age, which is probably a consequence of the poorly developed immune system and less immunopathology. The 1918 influenza pandemic was interesting because typically flu is very serious in the very young and the very old. But in the 1918, in addition to those two groups having high mortality, there was a, uh, an 18 to 30 year old peak in, in mortality, which we haven't seen uh, at all. Yes? Other than the very young and the very old, within the um, group that, that doesn't apply to, within basically everything that's not very young and very old, within that large You know, it's typically the extremes that have the most obvious differences. And there are these exceptions in the middle, which is flu, 1918 flu is one of them, but that, they're quite rare. Right? So here are the graphs for 1918 influenza. So on the top is a typical influenza mortality by age. So here is specific death rate by age. You see the very young uh, get lethal influenza, the very old as well. Um, but in 1918, in addition to those two peaks, there was also a, a peak uh, in this middle age group. And we don't understand why this was. Uh, there is some speculation that it may be that they didn't have immunity that was protecting people on either side of them. But it's really difficult to, to get an answer to this because it happened so long ago and there aren't any specimens left. Uh, another example of age-specific uh, disease dependence in people, West Nile infection. Uh, in Israel in the year 2000. Uh, this is the percent, the incidence of infection starting from very young to very old. So you can see West Nile infection tends to prefer older individuals. Uh, and the mortality is also higher. This is a percent mortality now, and you can see it's higher in the older individuals. <clears throat> Other determinants include sex. Males tend to be slightly more susceptible. Uh, pregnant women in particular have 
increased susceptibility to a number of infections, and in particularly influenza. If you uh, read the press at all, you, you, you understand that pregnant women in particular should be encouraged to get immunized. Malnutrition also increases susceptibility to virus infections uh, because it, it, it ruins your immune system and it also compromises physical barriers. And measles in countries where there is malnutrition is terribly more lethal, 300 times more lethal in developing countries where the children are uh, undernourished. It's really a terrible, terrible disease under these conditions. Cigarette smoking increases your susceptibility and people are just now doing experiments to find out uh, exactly what the mechanism is. Air pollution is another one uh, has been shown and stress, like stress leading up to a, an exam will <laughs> increase susceptibility. But as you know, stress spelled backwards is dessert, so use that as a solution. <laughs>